Hi, this is uh, Ryan Dross, the writer and creator of Stealth Hammer, the all-ages superhero adventure comic, and you're listening to and watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. Of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented creative person. Not only is he a comic creator, a comic book writer, creator, etc. He is also a podcast host of probably the best genre of 80s and all of that other stuff. You know what? Screw it. Why am I even talking about this stuff? Let's just introduce our amazing guest here. We're joined today by Ryan Drost, of course, the creator of Stealth Hammer and the podcast, Star Jones. How you guys? How you doing? Star? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. So, and I agree that is the best. That's the best era for. Our- any creative times gonna play a quick game of overrated underrated okay. obviously okay. this is the 80s edition okay be- just just because sure you know and i won't judge you for <laughs> is, i mean the internet ma- might but I- <laughs> of course i expect nothing less <laughs> <laughs> let's start this off right then star wars overrated underrated. for me personally it's underrated star wars is, is there's star wars and there's everything else for me so Star Wars is the number one thing for me, uh, especially I would say the new stuff that's out right now, I feel is underrated. I think it gets a lot of hate for it that is not deserved. Um, there's some things I, I agree with people on, but there, I feel like it's get, it gets a lot of hate for and that and doesn't deserve the hate that it's getting um, it is such a huge and massive world, especially when you get into the EU. Star Trek. Uh, overrated. I am not a Star Trek person. <laughs> I do love the movies. I really enjoy the movies. I just have never been able to get into the show. And I've had people that know the stuff I like and have suggested episodes for me. There's not enough action for me. Like episodes that they've shown, uh, I'm fine with people talking in a room. But when the whole show is mostly people talking in a room, uh, that's where you kind of lose me. Like the one episode I watched, they were like, it's an alternate reality type thing. I was like, oh, I love alternate realities watched it and I was like the most exciting thing happened was Picard jumped over the railing and I was like that was it and the whole thing was leading up to a ship going back to the past and I wanted to see that pay off and I never got to see the ship go back to the past it was just there there they go Ghostbusters underrated my properties are Star Wars Indiana Jones and Ghostbusters Ghostbusters is underrated especially the second movie I think the second movie is fantastic uh we won't talk about the 2016 one I could not be more excited for the new one that's coming out yeah Afterlife looks like it'll be amazing I know people that actually saw it already and uh they said you will not be disappointed Ghostbusters is my favorite comedy of all time uh, there are so many subtle little lines in it that it's, yeah, it's a perfect movie for me. Highlander. Uh, overrated? I will say because of this, some of the sequels. I think the first movie, if you're saying the first movie, it's underrated. It doesn't get enough attention. It doesn't get enough that it deserves. The f- what about the series? The series, uh, underrated. Again, I don't think it gets enough attention. Uh, I really, truly enjoyed the series. Um, again, it's it's definitely something that should be out there more than it is. Transformers. Depends on which Transformers we're talking about. (laughs) If we're talking about the 80s, it's underrated. If we're talking about the Aformers, it's way overrated. (laughs) The reason I will say it's underrated is the biggest problem I notice with a lot of people with it is they just refer to them as robots and they're not, they, they were living alien beings and they have personalities and interests and everything else. And you know, when a, a writer or creator recognizes that because it comes across in the dialogue and the interactions when someone doesn't they do come across as just robots last one then i'm afraid (laughs) yeah i'm I'm debating whether or not to say it smurfs i would say underrated there's a lot of lore that was put into smurfs that i don't think people recognize like it it is a just a fun cartoon series if you take it at that but there was a lot of undertones and a lot of thought that went into a lot of those episodes. And if you recognize that and do some homework on it, you find that out. Um, There's also a rich history of Smurfs comics out there that are just incredible and are well worth reading. Don't, it's not worth watching the live action movies. It's not that type of underrated, but <laughs> but read the comics, watch the old cartoon. Yeah, definitely underrated. 
exactly you know it's it's just like why why am i butchering an introduction when you could just introduce <laughs> yourself it's just so much easier looking at of course the comic itself. You have a Kickstarter campaign. You have a beautifully drawn comic. You have a little bit of a, a hint down below in your lower third there as well, too. But for those who don't know anything about Stealth Hammer, which is still an awesome name, I do love it. Uh, tell us what it's all about. Yeah, so I'll give you the origin of the name because it is yeah. an awesome name. It is actually a nickname of my wife. Her name's Jamie, which is the ma- name of the main character in the in the comic. Mm-hmm. Uh, she works as a graphic designer and she worked at an ad agency and one day she submitted uh, a pitch when everyone else was submitting like three, four pitches for a client and the client chose hers. The next time ideas went out, her boss put, well, watch out for stealth. So then she got that nickname for a while. And then uh, she worked at another place where she was in charge of brand compliance, which is where you have to say what what color uses are just right, make sure the things are located right and everything like that. So her boss always said, well, she's the one that has to lay the hammer down. So she put the two names together and probably for the last 15 years or so, she's been known as Stealth Hammer. And uh, we always said, oh, that'd make a great superhero name. And we would joke about it and everything. And then for one of her birthdays a few years ago, I had her drawn as a superhero and said, here's Stealth Hammer and gave it to her. And the second I saw it, it was like, I've related it to uh, when Paul McCartney says he woke up and had the song Yesterday stuck in his head. And just, it, he was done in like 15 minutes, writing it out. The second I thought that, that, oh, this could be a superhero, ideas were flooding my mind. We were on vacation and I gave it to her on that vacation for her birthday. And we're in like a outlet mall and I'm taking pictures of like clothes on mannequins that I thought my character would wear. And <laughs> I'm typing on my phone, like all these ideas as they're just like flooding in my head. So that's where the idea came from. I've called it a superhero adventure because it's not your typical mm. superhero story. Uh, I'm basically taking a superhero type character and throwing her in a world of, I relate it to Mega Man meets uh, Jim Henson's Creature Feature Shop. And it's a love letter to everything I've ever loved in comics. I always loved science, crazy science and technology. And I've always loved like mythology. So I wanted to blend those two together, much like going back to the 80s, uh, Masters of the Universe, uh, Thunder of the Barbarian, like that type of stuff. I always love blending those worlds together. So that's that's where uh, the story kind of led me to. Well, I mean, you're pulling from the best of the era, yeah. to, quite literally. I mean, those that those so for those that are maybe younger than us. <laughs> that are, are listening to us, you know, wax poetic about uh, the AD era that is incredible. Um, you're you're pulling from merchandising. You're pulling from uh, properties that are are quite that, like you said, they they inspired our lives. They inspired yeah. our, our creativity. They inspired everything about ourselves, uh, and you know, our wacky sense of humor. I'm yes. sure as well. I have always loved those stories where. You take it's it, you take that one character and you start small and you keep building and building and create this huge world and that's what really what I'm doing with this. So stories like um, Alice in Wonderland, Wizard of Oz, um, like some big Jim Henson fans of Dark Crystal, Labyrinth, things like that, is really where I pulled some inspiration from. And probably one of the big ones for me too was as a very little boy, my mom would bring me Peter Pan. And that, you know, you're dealing with a family in London. The next thing you know, we're there in Neverland and that world just gets bigger. And that's really what I'm doing here. Issue one, we start small, a lot of action in issue one, but yeah. we do start small. And in issue two, you'll see we're, we're growing bigger. That's what I loved about it because I got to read issue one and I was just immediately like caught up in that world because you throw a lot of stuff at the reader at once but it's it's to entice them to keep reading yeah. because it, especially like you, you mentioned Mega Man I mean you're taking science you're taking science and superheroes yeah. you know and, and merging them together to make something amazing and the fact that you know and you're also bridging the the fantastical with the supernatural of like you know Ari the Elf yeah oh place. yeah some names like the in the first issue we see Marzana that is a Polish deity of death and I was like that's a really cool character that I don't think I've ever really seen in very much. So I was like, I'd like to kind of spin that our own way with it and everything. So, um, so yeah, like you said, Ari the Elf, he is a really fun character to write. Uh, he has his own type of dialect, uh, much like Yoda would and things like that. So again, pulling from inspirations of my past, he lives in my head now. So I know how Ari's going to talk. 
<laughs> when I'm writing. <laughs> So the other thing is you were talking about like how there's a lot there to, to absorb and take in and how I refer to my writing is coin a phrase, I guess I call it Claremontian writing after Chris Claremont, because everything in there is in there for a reason. So if you see something in the background, you see a certain line of text, it's all there for a reason. There's stories behind everything. That's what we'll be building up to. So to give you an idea in the first issue you see in her bedroom, uh, which I love that scene, uh, there's a sword on the wall. On the cover of issue two, you see who owns that sword. There's a whole story that we're going to be telling about that. In issue one, on that first page, you see a little robot that's broken up in the corner. In issue two, we find out who that robot is, and we and that becomes a new character that's introduced in issue two. So there's all these little nuggets that I'm planting in there, including little things like the studio, the dojo that she teaches at and everything else. One thing with that was I always hated it when comics just all of a sudden the hero gets powers and they suddenly know how to fight. So I wanted to put something in there to show there and she knows how to fight already. So we've established in that first page or second page that she teaches judo. And uh, so I'm like, okay, she's established that she knows how to fight. But the name of that studio is Kodama Studio, and that is related to Japanese mythology, and that will play a factor in the future. So I wanted things where people later on would read something and go, oh my God, that was in the first issue. All these things are planned out. It's great as, as a writer to call back and, and provide those types of Easter eggs because it, it provides the perfect opportunity for going back and rereading your, your series, yes. you know, whether or not they... They subconsciously remember that that item or, or not and at least with this campaign and future campaigns i'm sure yeah. you know it's it's more of a driving force to say hey in case you missed it here you go right. and it's in, it's a great way to do a wonderful plan but as a writer uh, as well you have a great team behind you too yeah. and i want to i want to talk about the team because honestly uh, a lot of times it's the, the, you're a single creative person, you're the artist, you're the writer, you're everyone together, but to draw from other inspirations and other creative talents, yeah. who do you have on your team so that we can support? Yeah, I have a phenomenal team. Uh, and I tell them as often as possible because I feel like it's not enough to tell them, <laughs> to make them know how appreciated they are. So starting off, I have my main artist illustrator, Joel Jackson. Uh, he's been an illustrator for about 20 years, doing some independent projects here and there. Uh, but he has always wanted to work on something that was going to be uh, potentially an ongoing story. I love his artwork. And it's got this anime influence, but cartoony style to it. But it's super detailed. I needed someone, obviously, for the type of writing that I'm doing, I needed someone that could do detailed backgrounds detailed characters, but still have that fun all ages look to it. And he just nails that. And he is also a product of the 80s. He is a huge Masters of the Universe fan. He is a huge Transformers fan. So science and technology is not a problem as far as having him on this project. And then we have our colorist. So for issue one, we did have Ross Hughes and he is definitely known in the comic industry. He's worked on Justice League and Green Lantern and a bunch of other uh, projects. He just brought Joel's artwork to life. And for issue two, sadly, Ross decided to retire from doing full issues. He'll still do little projects here and there, but not full issues anymore. He's been doing it for 15 years along with a full-time job. He's like, it's just time for me to enjoy my life a little bit. And I totally understand that. So I reached out to some people I, I knew and got another legend in the industry to work on issue two, which is Chris Sotomayor. I've known Chris through a few people. I knew the type of work that he did and the amount of work that he does. And I was like, I, there's no chance, but I'll ask him anyways. And it's one of those things you don't ask, you don't get. And he's like, yeah, I'd love to do this. And uh, for those that don't know, Chris is currently doing coloring work for like Batman uh, titles and Spider-Man titles and X-Men titles. So in fact, just the other day, I was reading an issue, uh, just a comic, and all of a sudden I saw his name as the colorist. I'm like, oh my God, this is the guy who's working on my project. <laughs> Our letterer is Dave Sharp. Very well known in the industry. Uh, he's worked on Marvel, DC, independent titles and everything else. A uh, total professional. He, you know, he just does a great job, you know, brings that dialogue to life. And that was the thing too. I wanted, especially with doing the first issue, I was like, I can draw, but I can't draw at the level that I want it to look. 
And I wanted to bring something high level quality out there. So I surrounded myself with the best possible people I could get working on it. We also have for issue two, uh, an up and coming artist, uh, Scott Kruger. He did some variant covers for uh, like Star Wars adventures for IDW and a couple other things. Um, he reached out to me and says, I would love to work on this for you. He's also a podcaster. So uh, he was like, yeah, I'd love to do this. And he just sent me his artwork and it looks amazing two more people. One is the variant cover artist I have for this issue is someone, again, that I've always wanted to work with, and that's Chrissy Zulo. Uh, she is an amazing talent, has this awesome stylized. She has a huge fan base. I have followed her career for a very long time. And again, just reached out to her and said, hey, this is what I'd like to do. Here's a copy of issue one. You can see if you would like to work on it. And she's like, I would love to work on this. Um, she's like, but I can't do it till after New York Comic Con because I got to get prepared for that. And I was like, that's okay. If you can get me something during the campaign, that'll work. And she's like, I can totally do that. So I'm expecting something this coming week from her. Uh, so, and then once I get it, you better believe I'm going to be posting it all over the place because I've already seen a rough sketch of what she is doing and it is mind blowing. So looking forward to that. Um, and then the last person to mention, and certainly not the least of all of them, uh, is my wife. Uh, she is a graphic designer, and as I had mentioned earlier, and she came up with the logo, the title image, and she helps me with all of the promotional work that we're doing and everything else to get the word out there. Um, she is my PR person. So she's the one that uh, reached out to several people to be like, hey, can Ryan talk to you about his project? And uh, then she passes it off to me. And so I don't have to worry about that. I can do all the other stuff like appearing on shows. So <laughs> looking at your team then here uh, and yourself as a, as a writer, you know, what is the most important quality of a writer and an artist, especially in a collaborative effort like this for writing and drawing comics today? I think the most important thing um, is communication and being open to criticism. I'm a new writer. So I'm still learning. I definitely feel like my issue two is stronger than my issue one looking at it, but being open to those critiques. And I would say my team is very open to that. I am very open to that. I've had Joel come back to me on both issues and say, hey, because he's reading it cold. And he's like, this isn't totally clear. Is this what you meant to go for? And I'll, I'll go, oh yeah, that's what I meant. You know, I'll make adjustments and everything else. And there's times where I'll be like, hey, this, this looks like this to me. And he's like, oh, you know what? Yeah, you're right. Never saw it that way. Let me go ahead and do that. So I think that's one of the most important things is that you're communicating with each other and that you are open to critiquing because I really think, sad to say, but I think nowadays people view critiquing as criticism or, or negative criticism. Criticism is good, but negative criticism isn't so much. It's not helpful when really you should always view any type of uh, feedback as, as a gift. It's a, it's, it's a way to get better. Then in looking at yourself as a writer specifically, then what was the hardest scene for you to write in, in issue one and for issue two? The hardest uh, scene for me to write for issue one, I don't know if there was necessarily a scene, but it was trying to fit as much as I wanted to and make it a self-contained story. So that was the hardest part for issue one because I didn't know if there would be an issue two. It's kind of going back to Star Wars. George Lucas didn't know if he was going to be able to do more than one movie. So I wanted people to be able to pick up issue one, read it, get a nice self-contained story, but still leave hints that there's more story to tell. Um, so that was the hardest part for issue one. Issue two, the, the hardest thing to write is we're having Ari the elf present the legacy that uh, Jamie is a part of. So there's a family lineage of her being a guardian and her family being guardians uh, to protect the planet. And uh, from, you know, for the forces of evil. So he, he needs to present this like to her. And we have this amazing double page spread that is like this map old scroll that he rolls out. And I needed to describe that page in great detail because there was a lot of important factors in that. And I think that double page spread took two pages of text uh, yeah. just to describe everything that was happening. And I knew that Joel could draw it. That was the other thing was in issue one, I was new to working with Joel and I knew what his artwork was, but I didn't know what he was capable of. When we got into issue two, I told him, okay, you're in trouble now. And he goes, why? I said, cause I, now I know what you can do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know the level of art. I know how much I can push you to put on a page. And he hasn't disappointed me yet. So, so you said you're, you're new to writing. Is this the first comic book you've ever written? Yes. So I have always realized I've been a storyteller since I was little. Like when I was a kid playing with 
all those amazing eighties action figures and stuff like that. Um, I was, I lived on a main road, so there was no go playing in the street with the kids. I was pretty much my sister and myself. And so I would come up with these adventures where, you know, GI Joe made the transformers. And then all of a sudden there was this ruins that came up from the ground and that was castle gray skull. So I was always creating stories, you know, it's late in life. I'm in my mid forties, but I, I finally realized, and maybe, and maybe that's a good thing because there's some people that never realize it, but I just realized that, like, I've always been a storyteller. Um, I've always liked that. And that's why I got into reading comics and books and, and everything. And that's why even I went into podcasting was because that's a verbal way of telling a story. Um, and much like podcasting, I would hear a podcast and go, oh, I'd like to do that. So same thing, you know, I, I started talking with all these creators and I'm like, I have a story to tell. I have several stories to tell. Um, and then this is the one I chose to, to launch it with. And I'm very blessed because I had a lot of people that were willing to critique my writing and give me feedback and make the story stronger and, and everything. So um, while it's my first venture out, I also knew that I was new and made sure I got a lot of feedback on it. Being new to writing itself, when did you first learn that language had power? Uh, that would be high school. Like I said, I always had adventures and stuff like that, but I had a teacher in high school who you had a choice of multiple choice tests when it was an English teacher. So we would read something, you had a multiple choice test or you had to write an essay. I didn't have a choice. She saw something in my writing and she's like, I want you to do essays. And uh, she fostered that and boosted it. And when I went to college, I studied, uh, I majored in uh, psychology. I have my degree in psychology, which is Always great for a writer to have because <laughs> you can really get into the psyche of people. But I also did took a lot of English writing classes. I probably could have minored if I had made it like official, just took a lot of writing classes. And I had amazing teachers there that also pointed out like, yeah, you, you have a talent here for this. Why I didn't pursue it after college? I can't tell you. I don't know. But I'm glad I'm pursuing it now. Uh, you know, there's too many great stories out there of people that pursued things late in life and had an amazing run with it. And the biggest thing for me is issue one, it's already a big deal for me. So I've already accomplished one thing in my life that I always wanted to have, which is my name on a comic book. So now the rest is just gravy after that. <laughs> you talked about your influences in, in the eighties itself and in, in creating the world that you've created, but also creating your characters. Were there specific instances where you created a character initially, and then all of a sudden you realized, wait a second, they're more like this favorite thing that I have? Two, two things with that. One is there was a challenge I had with uh, Kyle in the first issue. He got hit in the head. It's the boyfriend of Jamie, and he gets hit in the head, and I didn't really have anything else for him the rest of the issue. And someone pointed that out to me, They're like, he kind of just disappears. And I was like, they're like, why don't you make it where that's a motivating drive for Jamie in the first issue? Like her boyfriend's been knocked out and she knows who did it. She's going to go after him. So I had a lot of people at the end of issue one, even though there is a line that lets people know that he's okay. A lot of people are like, is Kyle all right? <laughs> and I had a lot of fun with that because I was like, issue two, we established that he's okay. Like I said, it's not a, a spoiler because we do mention that in the first issue that he's okay. Um, but at the end of issue two, you're going to be questioning if another character is okay or not. And that one's intentional. <laughs> so for a nice little cliffhanger. As far as characters that like I that had those influences or, or that just kind of transitioned, uh, definitely Ari the Elf. Uh, I mentioned a little earlier, he's... He's kind of my Yoda character. He's that imp character that, you know, same, again, just like George Lucas, he pulled from mythology where it's like you have that imp wizard wise character. That's what Ari is, except he's a little snarky. Um, and uh, he, along with Watts, is kind of my R2D2 C3PO characters. So Watts is a robot that we'll get introduced to in issue two. She's very proper. Uh, she's very logical. Ari is very instinctual and snarky. So you can imagine which one is which character from R2 and 3PO. Um, oh, I couldn't. No, not at all. <laughs> um, but like I said, he's also kind of like my Yoda character. So, and, and he really has taken a life of his own and he's become a fan favorite and I love writing him. Uh, and I like playing the other characters off of him. Uh, one of the fun things that is uh, revealed a little bit in issue two and definitely will be developed as far as how it happened in issue, when we do issue three is Ari is addicted to strawberry milk. 
uh, he almost gets inebriated from it. It's the only thing that makes him happy. And uh, how that came about was my original artist who I worked with, Alexandra Scott, she did a little uh, sketch. She was doing character sheets for me and stuff. And she uh, drew Ari drinking a thing of strawberry milk and just for the fun of it. And all of a sudden I was like, as a writer, you see something like that and you're like, okay, that's part of the character now. We're going to see what we can do with this. And, uh, and right away, again, mine just started going, okay, this is, this is how he came across strawberry milk. This, now it's his favorite thing. It's the only thing that makes him happy. Um, so yeah, so the, there's little things like that that develop the character along the way. Now let's go into the Kickstarter campaign itself here. Obviously the campaign is doing very well. Uh, I, I love you know, you're, you had a great video, you had a great introduction, Thanks. you have a great team. Talking about the perks then for this campaign, because doing a Kickstarter campaign or a campaign for crowdfunding in general mm -hmm. is a second job. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> obviously. Um, what is the psychological aspect behind fear of missing out and your campaign? So obviously the video played into that. We got a lot of nice attention in the first, uh, for the first issue. I mean, I was actually appearing on television and things like that. It was, it blew up bigger than I expected. And um, I, I just really want the story to get out there. Like that's a big thing for me is I, everyone that's read it has, you know, fallen in love with these characters. And I just want more people to fall in love with it. That's a big driver for me is I just want people, I want to tell a great story that people enjoy. I wanted to make sure that if someone was approaching the second Kickstarter, that they didn't feel like they were missing out with the first one. So we have packages with issue one and two. You can also add it as an add-on if your package doesn't come with issue one. So that was really important to me that someone could get on the ground floor who may not have been here for the first one. Um, I never want someone feeling like they're missing out on something. As, as a comic book collector myself, I hate it when I'm uh, miss missing an issue to a story that I, I'm actually really enjoying. From a creative perspective, then, what is your kryptonite? My kryptonite is thinking I can do it all myself. <laughs> uh, I have burnt out a couple times already, as we talked about. That's probably pretty normal when you're running a Kickstarter. Uh, but yeah, I am very much, uh, it's not so much a control thing. It's not something where I feel like, oh, I have to do it all myself. It's just, I feel like and this happens in my regular work life too. It's just like, if someone's like, Hey, can you do this? I'm like, yes. So I am out there. I'm doing, you know, I even just ventured out to TikTok just to try to reach a new audience. Uh, and I'm having a lot of fun with that, but I finally had to realize I can't do all this on my own. I'm going to completely burn myself out. Um, so that's why my wife is now doing the PR stuff for me. Uh, you know, Joel is getting me the, the artwork. Chris is getting me the artwork. They're retweeting things. We're, you know, we're getting the message out there. I can't do it all on my own. I'm still doing a lot, of course, because I'm still very tired at the end of the day, but I expect that and it's totally worth it. Um, but yeah, that's my kryptonite is just not being able to, not being able to say no and thinking I, I can just do everything. I think that's human nature yeah. as well too. I mean, we, we have a default sense that if we say no, we're rejecting the person oh, yeah. or we're, it's like, well, this person can't do it. I'm not going to ask them. Again. Right. Yeah, for sure. Do you believe in writer's block? I do and don't, and, and I'll clarify that. So I do think that you can get temporary writer's block. I do think that you can reach a point where you're like, I don't know what to do with this. But I think for me, it's something that I can get myself out of very quickly. Um, and for me, what it is, is it's putting myself in a different, physically in a different place. So I'll go for a walk. I'll go for a drive. I'll uh, take a shower. Some of my best ideas come from while I'm in the shower because I don't have to think about anything else other than washing my body and whatever is going on. There's no other distractions. Let me put my energy into something else. And I think much like anything else, when you like when you're forgetting about something or anything like that, the second you start doing something else is when you remember that. Kind of the same thing happens creatively. Like the second I start putting my energy into something else, ideas start coming for uh, what I was trying to figure out and work on. It's the whole, you can't see the forest for the trees. If you could give up one thing to make yourself a better writer, what would you do? My job, my full-time job. <laughs> 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 if I could give up that, <laughs> I would be able to devote so much more time into becoming a better writer. <laughs> Just financially can't do that yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's completely understood. Was that too quick of an answer for that? <laughs> The fact that you instantly said that, uh, no, that means you've been thinking about that for a while. Yeah. <laughs> I've often been asked, what's your dream? I was like, my dream is to 
tell stories for the rest of my mm-hmm. life. That's that's the dream. Does t- telling stories give you a creative boost or does it make you creatively drained? It gives me a boost uh, for sure. My wife will hear me come down and start talking about an idea I have for where the story can go or a character. And she's like, you are so jazzed when you are talking about the where a character is going to go, what's going to happen with a character, what's going on with the story. She's like, I the energy level that comes off of you, she's like, is just amazing. Um, she's also pointed out to me that my brain doesn't work like most people. Uh, <laughs> and she meant that as a positive way. Uh, I'm someone who can take just about anything and then start coming up with a story for it. And it might not be the best story, but I can come up with a story. I'm often someone that can think of multiple scenarios and everything else just in life. And she's like, she's like, that's a gift. She's like, most people's brains don't work like that. And she's like, you definitely have something there that you was given to you and you've developed that you can just create these worlds and complex situations and it all makes sense in your head and you can tie it all together for other people to, to make sense of it. So then how many unfinished scripts do you have? I have several. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have one idea. Uh, so this was all ages. Uh, I have one idea that's definitely not all ages that I've had in floating around in my head since I was about 16 years old. Uh, much like I said, if I see something, it can spark an idea. I have a, an artist friend of mine who did a little art book and I saw a sketch that he did and it sparked an idea and I I've been hounding him ever since of like, hey, can can we do this? Like you draw it, I will write it and uh, we can just go from there. And that would be another all ages project. I, I definitely have a wide range of things I like like and enjoy and feel like I can write to. Um, this was just the first, hopefully, of many. At what point are we good enough? I never feel like I am good enough. I'm probably my own worst critic. For me personally, I don't think there's ever a time where you could say you're good enough. Uh, my dad was is is known for saying when he's working on a project, that's good enough. And for when my dad says good enough, it actually means it's perfect. If someone told me that I was good enough, I, I equate it to being perfect and no one's perfect. Uh, I feel like I can always get better. Um, so yeah, that, that'd be my answer for that. What in life is beautiful to you? There is beauty in just about everything. Yes, I understand death and horrible things that happen are not beautiful, but my favorite song of all time is Louis Armstrong's What a Wonderful World. It is my absolute favorite song, and that's how I try to view life. I am somebody who will go outside, look up, and look at the clouds and still try to make pictures out of them and go for a walk in the woods and notice the fall leaves are changing. And if I'm having a rough day, I'll just go out in my backyard and sit on a step with my dog and just breathe in deeply and look around. Like, it's... there. Beauty can be found in just about everything. What is something that someone should experience once in their lifetime? A trip outside of where you live. And when I say that, I mean completely outside. So at least leaving another state, if you can leave the country. I I realize that's not financially sound for everybody. So as I said, even leaving the state, going to a state that is maybe in a completely different section of the country. uh, I think it's important because it gives you some perspective of outside the bubble that you've been staying in. And uh, you start learning about other people's personalities, other cultures, o- other ways of life. And it will either give you a, pers- uh, a appreciation for the life you've lived, or it'll give you an appreciation for the life other people have lived and maybe make you wanna do better for yourself as well. So I think that's important for anybody. What's the wisest piece of advice that someone's ever said to you that stuck with you in your career? Uh, let it go. <laughs> not not to get all frozen on people, but <laughs> I had a buddy in college. Uh, I, I was definitely somebody who had a hard time um, letting things go. And I, I would hold grudges and things like that. And he finally just put me in my place. And he says, you have to learn to let something go. And that has stuck with me my entire life. And uh, I don't, because of that, you know, to throw out another cliche, because of that, I don't sweat the small stuff. Um, two mottos in my life are, uh, man plans and God laughs and, uh, <laughs> uh I'm blanking on the other one, but, uh, basically just being flexible. You know, you, you, you can't control everything. You, you don't know what's going to happen. Just be ready for it. Um, oh, the other one's hope for the best prepared for the worst. So I, I'm always hopeful that things are going to turn out, but I'm also ready in case, they, uh, and that lets me let go, let things go when they don't work out. Cause I'm like, okay, I was ready for that. What would be your... 80s movie title of your life. <laughs> wow. Oh, 
This is one I have not thought of. I've thought about everything in the 80s. <laughs> My 80s title. Jeez. Uh, I would say, I'm trying to think of something edgy that was done in the 80s, but, uh, <laughs> but I would say Living on the Edge. That sounds like a good 80s title. Um, I'm someone that I, I'm not a crazy wild adventurer, but I'm also one of these people that will try anything once. And I feel like the movie would be those action comedies where it's like the, the bumbling guy gets caught in something bigger that he shouldn't have been involved in. So like think like golden child or something like that. Uh, it's just like, next thing I know I'm on a, I'm in Tibet and I just don't know how I got there, but we're just going to roll with it. So yeah, living on the edge would be the name of it. Then what would be the eighties soundtrack? Oh my God. It's got to have at least two eighties montages in it. Oh, totally. So yeah. Um, there's definitely gotta be some hairband music in there. Uh, uh like preferably her. poison uh would be good that was my 80s group uh mm. and some bon jovi bon jovi still to this day is one of my favorite singers so um and then a little and then when we need the softer moments we'd have some billy joel in there so I, i'm a huge billy joel fans we're getting along perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> this this is good yeah but is there anything else that i haven't touched on that you'd like to those to share with those that are watching and listening to this interview. I, I think uh, we covered everything. Like you said, uh, if you like stories that uh, where everything in it matters, that you can read it on the surface and uh, just have a fun time, because that's what I'm trying to create is just a fun adventure story. You're going to like this. If you're someone that likes to dig a little bit deeper, I think you'll also enjoy this because there is definitely things in there to, to dissect and think about and speculate on. Everyone has one or two people that inspire them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? One would be my wife, uh, and I'm not saying that just to get brownie points. Uh, she obviously is the inspiration for the character. Uh, she has been my rock and my support through all of this. Um, I don't want to split my parents, because of, but those are the obvious answers. Um, but I will, uh, rather than trying to pick one of my parents, I will say my sister. Um, so obviously my parents were a big big factor in my life. But my sister, uh, she's my younger sister. She has always had my back no matter what. We've been, you know, each other's best friends through our whole life. So I would say my wife and my sister, are both people that always are in my corner and always boosting me up uh, whenever I need it. And uh, both have been inspirations in my life. From a professional standpoint, you have created a comic book. You're on to issue two. You have a Kickstarter that is if not funded, it will be funded very soon. So from a professional standpoint, you are successful. Do you consider yourself personally successful? I don't. I feel like success is determined by other people. Uh, so I, I leave it up to other people to determine if they feel I've been successful. But what I will say is I do take moments to step back and enjoy the milestones that I've had. So issue one was created. That was amazing. You know, even getting funded for issue one, having the support is amazing. Launching the second one has been incredible. Being on shows like this, it's, I, I take a step back afterwards and get to watch it and go, that was really cool. That was a lot of fun. So I do enjoy the journey, but as far as um, whether I'm successful or not, I again, I think that's something for other people to determine or not. What do you think that? I feel like, cause I'm never done uh, because uh, to me, success kind of has that finality to it. And for me, I'm, I'm never going to be done uh, until I'm in the ground or wherever. By the time I pass away, there might be other, I might be, my brain might be in a robot, who knows. I'm never finished. So therefore, uh, I, I will never look at myself as being successful because to me that there's a finality to that. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Failure for me is a gift. So yes, I do let myself be sad about it, but um, I'll pull something from another influence that I had, which is uh, I loved the show Lost when it was on. And there was a line from that where uh, he, uh, the main character, Jack says, I, I let myself uh, envelop that fear, or in this case, that failure for, uh, and I give it 10 seconds. I let it just fully envelop me. And then I, and then, uh, and sometimes it's longer than 10 seconds, but I let it fully envelop me. And then I go, okay, what can I learn from this? What can I do? I mean, our first Kickstarter was not successful. And then I learned a lot from it and launched, launched it again uh, with making changes to it. And uh, it was very successful. So uh, 
I'm not someone that gives up. Hence, that's a tagline of my character. Uh, she says this, that's not how this story ends is her tagline, which is actually a line my wife has used in life, which is why, where I pulled it from. And uh, I'm like, I can't let my character never give up if, uh, if I'm willing to give up. So um, I just learn from the failures. I just analyze it, take a look, maybe that's a psychologist in me, but I analyze it, take a look at it and go, okay, what can we do differently? to make sure we get the outcome that we want. So, um, so yeah, I, I fully embrace the, the failure and let myself be sad about it and all that. And then I move on from there and figure out, okay, what can be done to make it better. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. And hopefully the 80s influences inspires them to watch some really good old shows as well too. How can they inspire the generation that follows them to be creative? Um, I think the biggest thing is for them to be willing to look back. I know that was a big thing for me growing up was I looked back at, I watched a lot of stuff and read a lot of stuff that was around before me. So I'm well versed in Abbott and Costello and the Three Stooges and the Little Rascals, along with all the black and white monster movies and, and all that type of stuff. So I, I grew up with looking back at old radio dramas and, and things like that. Um, reading a lot of you know classic books and everything because there's so much to gain from those because they they pulled from stuff before them and I think that's a big thing that this next generation can do is don't stop just because it was before 2000 uh, you know look you they there's so much access to so much stuff now that we never had and we were able to go back I mean I took trips to the library to be able to look into all this type of stuff as a kid um, all, all they have to do is pull up their phone and they can have access to tons of stuff. So be willing to look back at that. Um, don't be afraid of, you know, reading things and, and exploring things. And, um, and, uh, yeah, I, I think that's the biggest thing is to, to realize that all these things that came before you, you know, you're not the first person to come up with an idea. I guarantee that like, there's nothing in stealth hammer that, hasn't been done before. I'm just trying to tell it in a, in a way that works for me and that I think might be a, a new, fresh look at it and everything else. But you can obviously see all the influences in there and that's not a bad thing. So, uh, and I can tell you the people before you pulled from influences before them and before them and before them. So don't be afraid to look back and realize that there's a lot of great material before what you're doing and that it might inspire you to, to on something that you're working on. Well, I do hate to say it, Ryan, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You've survived uh, an interview, another one. I'm <laughs> sure you'll have more in the future while your campaign is going on. But before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? And where can we find the Kickstarter as well? Yeah. And when does it end? Oh yeah, yeah. for sure. Uh, so Stealth Hammer is on uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and just recently on TikTok. I'm actually putting a video out every day on TikTok, uh, and I'm having a lot of fun making a complete fool of myself. So, uh, so check those out. Um, and I, I post artwork whenever I can, give updates and interviews like this one. You know, once this is out, I'll, I'll be sharing that with everybody. So, and then the Kickstarter itself, you just look up Stealth Hammer, uh, and you'll find the latest one on there. There's there's three on there. This is uh, Stealth Hammer. The sci-fi adventure continues. We're at, as of this recording, we were at four, uh, almost at 4,000. Uh, we're looking for 9,000 to, to reach our goal. And all I get no money from that. 100% of that goes towards my creative team because I believe in paying your creative team uh, for the rates that they deserve to be paid. Printing costs and anything we go above and beyond our goal goes right into giving people more good stuff. So last time we were able to do extra prints and we just sent them out to everybody that got at least a physical copy. And uh, it ends on Sunday, November 21st at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So we wanted to kind of get in there before Thanksgiving, before the holiday season fully kicks in. I thought the end of a weekend is the perfect place uh, before the craziness of the next week starts. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show, Ryan. I do greatly appreciate it. And I, I can't wait to see what you come up with in the future as well too we'll have to have you back on as well because i want to talk about your podcast as well yeah. i know we didn't quite get to touch on it but i'm always up for geeking out over the 80s the best decade ever absolutely so, yeah. i'd be happy to come back i'd appreciate you having me on
like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Uh, you can, of course, find this interview and thousands of others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. And, of course, on our YouTube channel, which is updated a little more than the website. I apologize. YouTube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT Media. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell, and it's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking. Hey all, Kurt Sasso here from Two Geeks Talking. If you like this video and these quick clips here, make sure you take a look at our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe as well. Hit the bell to make sure you get notifications, of course, from videos like this here. Thank you everyone for listening and watching over the years and keep listening and watching for new and exciting interviews with talented and creative people in the entertainment industry. I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Thank you so much.